Welcome back, everybody. This is the eighth episode of Human Inc., an intern Slack special. I'm, I'm sitting here with Violetta Krzysztof and Matt Bateman, and we will be talking about children and learning. So very fittingly, the episode, uh, episode's title is How Should Children Learn? Um, Violetta, do you maybe want to start uh, by entering yourself, and then we will pass the mic on to Matt. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll, um, I'll introduce by myself by uh, speaking about my own educational experience, like my own, because that's kind of driven my life and the other way around. Um, so as long as I can remember, I loved math. So pretty much that drove my educational path. Uh, but also I think what drove it was uh, that I wanted to emigrate from, to immigrate from Eastern Europe to Western Europe. Um, also, you know, on having three young babies, uh, a big love, a family to support, so it seems like your path in life, educationally speaking, is has a lot to do with what you do in school. It didn't for me. So the only thing that was more related to education was my love for math. Other than that, even the university I chose to go to or the country I, I, I decided upon was very much driven by other issues like family or love or having babies or stopping a degree because I had another one or continuing another one or going even into a domain because of my love for children. So yeah, I started in finance in undergrad, but then I um, ended up uh, doing a PhD in like interdisciplinary where I studied um, educational psychology, math, uh, educational philosophy and linguistics. So yeah, that's pretty much it. There's this, uh, there's this um, kind of tongue-in-cheek, uh, you know, general wisdom that a lot of psychologists become psychologists because they want to be in therapy for a little bit more uh, or a little bit longer. Do you think this is um, the same for teachers? Um, do you think that, you know, when you you're, yourself were preparing to become a teacher, did you notice that um, your classmates or your, your mates were more people who had a bad experience at school and they wanted to become teachers that they would have um, liked to have had? Uh, or was it more like um, teachers are people who used to love school and they just want to stay there for longer? As far as I could observe, and I also taught teachers, like future teachers, um, it was always, and many women, uh, it was always driven by love of children and just by wanting to be around children. That, that was my overall observation. Like I could, I could do, in some cases it was also, I could do a better job. I, I can do it. Um, yeah, that's my impression. I love this so much. What is something that you noticed um, people get super wrong about children? I mean, obviously you come from Eastern Europe, I come from Eastern Europe, we both immigrated to the West, um, although you immigrated kind of across the pond. I'm in Western Europe right now. I, so we have a lot of, you know, we see a lot of contrasts around how people treat children just by, I don't know, going into a cafe and hearing how a mother talks to their child can be very much, you know, dependent on cultural context or linguistic um, tool sets there that, they're, that, that are expected of mothers or are kind of like, shoved up on mothers so what would be something where you you notice maybe a wrongness that is is global probably treating them as humans just not as little adults but as humans living a life and just treating them as such so not as like future beings but as present beings I love this so much. Matt, would you um, agree with this? And would you like to maybe take the mic at this point? I think you have a lot of, <laughs> a lot of things to say. Yeah, about. no, I, total, I totally agree with that. I mean, the, um, I think like in terms of a concrete mistake that people make in the U.S., and it varies a lot by culture, but in the U.S., I think that people tend to think of childhood as less serious than it. it, it there, there's a kind of element in childhood of like, children want to know things and they want to do real things and they want to work and they want to get things right. And in the U S there's this kind of culture of like childhood is about play and imagination and fantasy. And you've got to protect that kind of magical childhood time. And there's something to that childhood is about 
play, um, um, but but there's a missing element there. Um, in other places, that is not the problem, so that doesn't generalize. Um, I mean, in China, I think the children are essentially treated like objects, um, more or less. Um, so, um, I mean, not always, um, and there's a lot of variation, but that that's the mistake there. Um, so, um, yeah. Doesn't I, try I... to then this kind of overemphasize utopian happiness of childhood, which, for example, my childhood was yeah. not happy in the utopian sense. Like, I have a lot of bad memories as well, and it's so strange. Like, when I talk with a child, I try to look at them like, you know, they are a person who, you know, have positive and negative experiences. And it's not just like, oh, it's like a pink bubble in which everything is perfect. I mean, if this was true, then children would behave very differently. <laughs> and I'm sure you both know of your, about your own children that sometimes they are not super happy or contented with what's going on. Uh, but I'm just going to uh, pass the mic on to you, Matt, so you can uh, also maybe um, say a little bit about your work, uh, which is also um, heavily informed by, um, you know, um, the, the, the strong mission of, of wanting to give a better childhood um, to children and a more effective yeah. one as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I am a, the kind of lead pedagogue at, um, at Higher Ground Education, which is this missionary Montessori organization. We open lots and lots of Montessori schools. We've got 70 around the world right now. Um, and we also provide a lot of Montessori services and programming in other ways. And that is um, kind of figuring out, getting the programming right there, figuring out what children need in all of these contexts, whether you're, um, we've been doing a lot with home pods recently because of the pandemic and, and virtual learning. We also have a lot of brick and mortar schools, as I just mentioned. So just like really taking the pedagogy seriously at every level um, is my job. My back, my background um, is kind of going in reverse order. Um, this is probably my third-ish career. Um, um, I have a PhD in philosophy, um, um, studied mainly the his a combination of the history of ideas and then integrations of philosophy and cognitive science. Um, I um, had a kind of like pseudo tech career um, that I sort of used to get by um, before before I went from philosophy, and then my um, my my education was for the most part um, very standard U.S. public school. I grew up in the southeast. Um, most of it wasn't anything to write home about. Most of it was completely forgettable. Um, honestly, um, the two the two standout items of my early childhood education or my childhood education that I remember is, is one just having a lot of I think I was raised like a year before stranger danger hit <laughs> um and, and um and and I and, and I was growing up in rural South Carolina and I was just allowed to like it was like going down to the creek seeing 16 hours like and and that was my kind of elementary school experience especially in the summers and weekends and that I remember very distinctly. I think that that did a lot of good for me. I mean, it wasn't school. It wasn't what you would call education, but I probably spent about 10,000 hours next to that creek and I learned a lot. Um, it was very formative for me. Um, and then um, I did this funky semester program that unfortunately just shut its doors after 20 years of operation called City Term when I was a senior in high school. So it was like, leave home, spend a semester at a boarding school, um, and like three days a week of, of like serious seminars and three days a week you go into New York City and like encounter life basically. Um, I would do and that, that was now. Also I would do that now. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the legacy lives on in different forms. So that specific program no longer exists. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the, I've all, like uh, Violetta, I've always loved children too. That has been a distinctive through line. Like I w I've always been the boy babysitter and, um, in college, I um, worked in the college um, kind of lab preschool that the developmental psychology uh, department had attached um, attached to the university, and I was always the the dude working there too. Um, so, um, and I and I have a um, I have a little Corona baby, my eight month old Alice. So I'm a recent parent. So everything that I learn and teach and do in my professional life, I'm now kind of experiencing in a very personal way. <laughs> Love it so much, and I, yeah, I, it's it's so funny that we already refer to them as Corona babies. But I, I think you you had uh, your baby on the way even before the pandemic started, so you were having babies before it was cool, right? <laughs> like it was yeah, it was on the way before the <laughs> pandemic started. Yeah, but it was born oh. like a week before the New York lockdown. She was born. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, and as as you guys are talking, first of all, I'm I, I'm so in awe for people who dedicate um 
you know, their, their lives um, to the betterment of children. I come from a, a family of pedagogues um, for like five, six generations. Everybody felt uh, a need to educate other humans, um, different ages. Um, and it kind of to the degree that I, I kind of, you know, went to dig up my uh, family tree and found out that across the country, across the kind of Pannonian basin, people just like met and fell in love without knowing that the other person also has this, you know, genealogy of, of teachers. So it's like multiple teacher kind of bloodlines um, that kind of randomly met. And maybe there is something about uh, the children of educators that kind of just radiates off of you and you recognize the other, I don't know, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. I, but I'm also kind of dreaming, and I don't know if this is, um, you know, this is in line with your thinking, but I'm also dreaming uh, of a world where we don't have to actually like emphasize like why we like children. <laughs> just like the normal thing to feel like what else you would be feeling about children um but yeah i, I guess it's a, it's a kind of a different category of um you know when when somebody actually likes us like i'm going to be specialized as a job to um to work with children although maybe this is being a little bit you know maybe this is changing a little bit because so many parents have their kids in the house now um and and it's not just like oh if i have time i will help you do your homework it's that you're actually, you know, as a child, you are in the space uh, where your parents are during the day um, and they will end up educating you a little bit whether they like it or not. Um, so do, do you see that as a positive trend um, in like for family relations or for the cognitive development of children? I personally love the, the stay at home period, really. Um, my, my kids go to school, like to, not quite regular school because they go to circus school where they spend half the day doing circus art. But I've always wanted to homeschool and because of my own work, I could never really dedicate myself to. So I really, I really love this. So it's not just because of the homeschooling, but also because of a lot of work, like all the work we did together, like laundry, cooking, baking. So I felt I felt a really good connection with my kids, with my family. It, it was almost too good to be true, like a, my little bubble. I felt that we're emerging um, somewhat um, like very synchronized, but also in weird ways. Like now when we go out, we, 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 we yell more and we speak in our own kind of jargon. That's a mix of Romanian and Hungarian and English and French. So our idiosyncratic ways become even more visible. Um, but yeah, I really it's like love developing it. a twin language for the family um, that only you guys understand. It feels like that, like a gang, really. That 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 feels like that's how it's been evolving. But I love it, and the kids too. Yeah, I I want to hear more about circus school, but I'll answer the question. <laughs> um, I I um. It's a mixed blessing. I mean, in a certain way, I love it. I love the kind of um, blending of um, pedagogy into the home. I like, I think the fact that parents are confronted via online learning and, and these other mechanisms with like what actually goes on in school, um, may, basically almost forces parents to kind of have more of a thoughtful judgment about education. It's like, wait, is this what I want? Is this what's going on You know, in school? Is this, is this something that I'm, I'm okay with? And I, like a lot of parents, and this, like, this is, again, might be a US centric comment, but I don't think it's totally US centric. A lot of parents don't think that much about education and pedagogy. It's like, you, you know, you send your kid to the school that's like near where you live in your zip code or whatever. And um, hopefully it's a good school and you might, and you might look at like whether or not it's a good school in some sort of general way, but you don't think that much about like pedagogy and development and what exactly um, counts as a good math education and what are you in it for? Like, what, what is the point of education even? And kind of what is, what are, what are the fundamental schools of thought in education? Most parents don't really think about that. And I think that, um, and that kind of being confronted with children, your, your children at home and whatever educational service they're getting is an opportunity to shake things up. I mean, that is how, that's the, that's the positive side of it. Um, um, I love the idea of home pods and, and homeschooling. So, I mean, if you have access to that and, and a, like a good version of that, or like whether you're an educator yourself or whether you can pull it together or whether you have access to services or tutors or people who can help you do it well, I think that's a really good option. I mean, the terrible thing right now is um, 
for most like it's not like society has a system of at-home education ready to go and scale like for most people uh, for a lot of children um, who, who are at home right now they are not learning as much as they would have I mean as much as I criticize the conventional um, education system and, and I'm a huge critic of it like I don't think that it should just be like shut down and like you know now you're stuck at home and you've got to figure it out and there's no transition like it, it's a real disaster for a lot of people um, so you know it's a great opportunity it's, it's also a real problem um, and it also takes us to the big question of tonight which is how should children learn right and and can we just kind of say children uh, or are we talking about a bunch of individuals with i mean, maybe you know um deeply different um needs uh, almost impossible to serve by one single system how should we even start um, thinking about it? Is there a good angle to angle of attack um, when it comes to um, figuring out um, what, what, what's the best way? I can, say, I can say a little to just get us started, which is, I mean, I think any discussion of how children should learn has to start with a reflection on what do we know about how children do learn successfully? And, um, and, and there's a few like kind of stakes in the know, ground. That, do we know? Do we, do we have a kind yeah. of reliable, um, I mean, I don't think like like I don't think that there's like an uncontroversial, detailed scientific theory of children learning that everybody would agree upon. But I think that we know certain things. I mean, this whole field is contentious. But I mean, I, I like the stakes in the ground that I would start with is, is I would say, learning happens kind of fundamentally by the activity and the agreement and the engagement of the learner. Like that that the, the learning is a kind of thing that a person does um, that they have to assent to at minimum and and kind of at maximum kind of actively drive and engage um so seeing seeing learning as coming from the child learning is not something that you do to a child but learning is something that comes from so this is a very progressive idea and i think it's right and then the other thing is um right and we also know like what doesn't work right so we can kind of approach from yeah yeah i mean look there's I mean, that principle that I just said, there's a lot of people who would argue against it. A lot of people. And, and they have un, not crazy arguments. Like direct instruction is the most well-researched, effective kind of method. And, um, and, and that has to be kind of contended with. And then the other thing I would say is um, learning, it, it's like any successful process. It's not just like the learner is motivated and they go and learn. There's a definite structure and kind of way to learn ideas and certain ideas are more helpful than others there are kind of power tools of knowledge like math and grammar and um, key ideas in civil in the history of civilization that like I, I think you you should learn if you, they're tremendous helps to learn and that to get children interested in them and to make them accessible to children there's a kind of definite kind of way in and structure there that you have to think about the kind of child's context and sequence and so um, I mean those the those are the things that I would start with is just that it, learning happens by the ascent of the learner and the activity of the learner and the but learning it's a, like a definite process you've got to think about the kind of structure of the learners um, you know what can you do as a teacher to actually help this help this along and there's a lot you can do um, and I'm kind of like taken back to um, where Violetta you said a, a little bit earlier um, how you know I'm just doing laundry with your kids or they, they you know as they see what happens in the garden or what happens in the CC I'm you know that's also incredibly um, you know um, worthwhile and, and useful and, and it's also part of learning although it might be much less um, kind of systematic as what Matt um, uh, outlines so I would love to hear your take on it. I'll pick up on uh, Matt's um, thread of progressive education where children learn by doing. And um, I think the most familiar uh, philosopher um, in this domain I'm with is John Dewey, who had this idea like circa 1900. And he was really progressive. So like he wanted children to learn through occupation. So that was his big thing. How do we carry the occupations that children used to do at home inside the family, like sewing or um, making food or like harvesting. How do we bring that into school so that children find motivation, learning, social insight? Um, how do we make uh, a community of learners a sort of an embryonic democracy? And to me, like, uh, that he had these ideas in 1900, like more than 100 years ago. 
and we've come so little in the way of creating such education is very telling, but maybe something that's very interesting that he said uh, that can point to some of the failure of the progressive system is that he was very, uh, he was very definite in saying that play and interest and fantasies should not just be indulged interests. They should be carried on with some rigor and there should be learning that's abstract and that's definite even in you know playing with things so what i'm seeing now is this hybrid and the, yeah on the other side is like i've been brought up in the eastern european very much russian influenced uh, system that's very much direct instruction um where you just learn your stuff and directly and you memorize However, the advantages of that was that, like, for example, math, the succession of the topics in math was really, really well studied. So, like, you learn fractions, somebody really thought out what the succession of topics that you have to do in order to understand fractions. So, like, really an epistemological study of how you know number. And then you learn directly those abstractions. So we have on one side this progressive education where you learn by doing versus direct instruction where you learn by just, you know, memorizing facts and just like following a succession. But what I'm seeing now is a hybrid where, um, where let's play with apps, let's play with manipulatives, let's learn about fractions via pizzas and slices of pizzas and so on. But then when we move to the abstract, there's no, the math is not there either. So it's like, let's learn by doing, but then there's no connection to the concrete nor to the abstract. So that's my, that's my take on what's happening right now. So I think both direct instruction and progressive education have huge merits if done right. So Yeah, I, to I totally agree with that. I mean, I think, I mean, I, um, I'm definitely a kind of Montessori in my pedagogical outlook. And, it, and I view her as grappling with that problem that Violetta just outlined. Like it is like the whole issue is, you know, it, learning is like cooking. Like, like you can't just like put a bunch of random stuff in the oven and like expect something to good to come out. There's a definite process. Like if you want to understand fractions, there's a kind of way to do it. Um, and the same thing goes for any idea. Like if you want to actually understand what are, what are the things that people care about, like evolution and vaccines and the like, the like key things that people are like, I can't believe that human beings don't understand these ideas yet. Well, how do you teach them? How do you make them accessible? Like, like some, some pedagogue has to think through how that's made accessible to children and help teachers kind of bring that about. And it's also true that um, learning is driven by the activity of the learner. There's no kind of substituting that process. So these things have to be integrated into a system. And I totally agree with Violet. I think we're getting the worst of both worlds to some extent. Like I think, I think the direct instruction that we get now isn't that good and isn't that thoughtful. Like it doesn't follow a really well researched scope and sequence. It's really demotivating. Um, and then the progressive education that we get, it's, it's like project based learning with no follow up. Like, like there's this. And so um, it's like this low agency, low structure system that, that I think doesn't work. Um, I mean, that is, that, that's the kind of most damning critique you can play against contemporary education. There are lots of spots of brightness. I mean, education is not a kind of univocal system across the globe. Um, Have you guys looked at um, like more innovative, you know, like mathematical education innovation in Finland or Singapore? Um, sometimes these articles come out, uh, fab yeah, fabulous results um, and kind of paradigmatic different um, approaches, particularly in Singapore, um, how, how to teach math, because we kind of teach math the same way in Europe and in the West as the Greeks did, right? So it's very kind of like a chronological, we do everything chronologically in the West, which is kind of one way of doing it, right? So when I was studying, I, I wanted to be a historian for a long time, right? And the way we studied history was like, we started with the bones found in the Old Dubai Gorge, and then you work your way up through you know like the centuries i am um, and that you know, sounds awesome that's not how i learned <laughs> sorry say again so that sounds awesome that's definitely not how i learned it was awesome but because we you know i come from a part of the world where the, the events of the 20th century have not been processed and and kind of there's no historical consensus about the 20th century 
I basically spent one and a half years um, studying the Australopithecus and absolutely no time studying anything that happened after 1940. So that's you know, another that sounds, that, that sounds less populace less. who, who is, <laughs> just doesn't understand what happened in their own country in the past hundred years and then they are making political choices and are very gullible in many ways. So, um, you know, it has also its own, own problems. But I, I, I love like, if you want to be an archaeologist, it's awesome. If you want to be like a person who does something with uh, like, you know, like, I don't know, like codex uh, deciphering, it's great. Like you will spend so much time in like the, the, the 12th century. <laughs> yeah. Not sure that's that. That's, but actually, I, mean, I, I think, think of one. Sorry, say again. I said, I think that, I mean, not, what you described is not a good system. You've got to go up to the present and kind of make it relatable. But um, in general, I think that the, if you're kind of thinking about what is the, like, there's this term in education, scope and sequence. Like, what is the curricular? Like, what is the content covered, and what's the order in which you cover it? And it kind of gets at the structure of the content knowledge. I think a good clue for scope and sequence for children is often history. It's like, what is the history of this idea? Like, how did human beings originally get motivated to think about and understand this topic? It doesn't always work, but but it's a good kind of heuristic um, for a curriculum designer. So I I like the historical progression, but um, yeah, I mean us. Australopithecus, whatever, like that's not even human beings yet. So you got you got to kind of move through to civilization. And yeah, it, it should be like I, I think like this is what Elon Musk is experimenting with in um, his school at Astra, right? That he started inside SpaceX and um, how to teach children, um, you, how to teach the utility of things through the results, right? And this would be you know, uh, probably uh, the same thing for, for learning history. Like this is why people love the book Sapiens, for example, because it answers the question, how did we get here? And then it kind of like, you know, rushes you through a, a specific writer's version of history, right? Uh, but it's quite engaging because everybody's interested in their own lives and their own eras, obviously, and you want to know how you, how you got there. Um, and I, I see the same thing in, in like, I loved physics, um, in school because he, physics was taught from a historical perspective, right? So you kind of learn like, this is what Torricelli did. And then you learned about his stuff. And, and that was, there was a story and it was exciting and you understood the utility of that thing, right? Um, so I do, do get that. We're kind of like circling around the, the biggest problems, right, here. Um, and I know that, uh, Violetta, you have your own kind of, you're developing a global system at home as I understand, you know, working at Rome and working with your kids on projects in Rome and kind of using this whole new way of logging information and searching information and connecting information as a way of, of, edu of kind of rethinking education. Um, and Matt, I mean, your entire career is, is kind of like responding to unmet needs of children. So I would love to, I would love to maybe hear um, uh, from you, and I know this is a big problem, but like what would be like one thing for each of you that you would say is like the major number one most urgent problem to solve um, um you know in how we try we are trying to make children learn things um and then we will get to possible solutions so concretely i think um i think parents should know more about how children learn and should get away from this emphasis on grades and maybe that would solve a whole lot of problems i think if so instead of focusing on the dichotomy or like the conflict between well is it private school is it public school is it home school i think one immediate move that that parents could do is to be deliberate in their in their uh, parenting with regards to schooling um, and I hope with the pandemic uh, picking up on what Matt said they, they became more aware of that um, and my experience view as even as type A like quite ambitious mom and with traits of tiger mom too I'd say it's very very possible to achieve even conventional success if you're deliberate about what you learn. So like really just not stop caring about grades. How about that? That's, that's, I think that's very, very toxic. Parents pushing their kids to have good grades 
prepping them since kindergarten to be a successful candidate for college. So that's, I think, the kind of the most urgent and like almost direct impact thing you could do. Secondly, in terms of what can be done in schools and in relation to my work at Rome, I think it's um, very important that children know how to learn how to be wrong and how to be wrong in interesting ways and how to um, have ways to collaborate and to augment intelligence in collective ways by being wrong many times and by iterating many times. So just an anecdote, I started the pandemic, like really, I wanted to have a, a curriculum. Like I wanted to, okay, I'm gonna go through this and this and this and this. And I was, I was very unhappy because I couldn't be very rigorous about something if I didn't go with enough depth. And then my daughter had a presentation about Greece to do for her online school. And from there and in Rome, we went through uh, tales, geometry, we did Euclidean geometry. Then we talked about paradoxes and Hilbert and then problem solving with Polya. And I was, a, I was able with Rome and this interconnected language to explore with a rigor that I was happy with, but with enough wonder so that I keep the kids engaged and my self-interested. So that's in terms of pedagogy, I think that's a, a win to explore. And I, I know Montessori and you know the School of Dewey also work like that. But I think it's possible to, to do it with rigor, which is what I'm, I'm very much into. That's awesome. From Euclid to Hilbert, I love that. Um, yeah, I'm going to try to, it's hard for me to make things concrete because there's so many particular things that I think, I don't, I don't think that education is in a place kind of globally where if you just kind of fix one or two concrete things that the rest will fall into place. I think it's, I think it's a mess. Um, but um, kind of for, for parents who are thinking about this, the two kind of big outcomes that I would think about, basically no matter how old your child is, um, from you know, early childhood through adolescence, is um, one is kind of work. Like what are they doing that's kind of like producing something that's not wasting time, that, that gets them on top of tasks, whether it's like a young child kind of like concentrating on a practical activity or an older child trying to organize a work product, like how much of that can you motivate them to kind of follow through on? Are they getting the stick with itness and the work ethic? Building interdiscipline, not just in the sense of like, we're holding them accountable, but like they're, you know, really kind of, um, they, they want to kind of see a project through and they're getting everything that, um, everything that comes with that. So work and kind of work ethic. And the second is basically the positive flip side of what Violetta just said, which is, um, like you, you want to raise kids to care. Like every kid, I think naturally cares about getting things right. Like knowledge wise, like they want to, they want to know what's true, or they want to be on a quest for the truth. And that I think needs to be nurtured and cultivated through the curriculum. And th and that means being wrong a thousand times. But but kind of what motivates that is like, yeah, you're wrong a thousand times because you're trying to figure it out, and you notice when you're wrong, and you discard that. And um, and so knowledge not just in the sense of academics though i think it is it does involve academics and, and kind of core learning but i'm um, in the sense of um really wanting to know and um and, and wanting to be right in a non-neurotic way but just like care like you know there's a different like imagine a child who um i don't know cares about the environment and, and and kind of fixing the environment there's a way to care about that that where you're like on a moral crusade but you don't really care about getting it right you're not like what are the facts here like what are the best arguments for it what are the best arguments against it you're you're paranoid about kind of you know you want to be on a quest for truth um there, there you want to kind of couple that rigor and i think that that rigor is the pursuit of truth basically and and if you kind of get those two things right like really want to get it right truth wise and the child is working, like it's, they're putting forth effort and persistence, um, the, all the, you'll get everything else, basically. Like if you can just kind of um, follow those threads where they lead. Um, yeah, and I can add to that, Matt, uh, um, with my experience with my children, that I can't emphasize enough how much satisfaction kids get from real work and from the fruits of their work, like real totally. work. 
have them, okay, I have to do something with Norbert. I have to work on something. Kids, how about you clean up the house and do the laundry? And then they really, really help us and they get immense satisfaction from that. So, and I think a lot of the ills of, you know, that society complains about for, for with respect to children and teens could be solved by just like more wholesome work, like doing laundry, doing real stuff for, for the family. And they're happy to, like, I can, I can sense that really. Not, not only are they happy to, but like, so I used to be a college professor and most of the 18 year olds that I got, like I taught at good universities, right? Very smart, very qualified on paper. Like they were lacking in like something like they didn't know how to do their laundry. Right. Um, like everybody had something like this basically. And not only, I mean, you think you can learn it. Like it's not that hard to learn how to do your laundry, but you don't, it doesn't like when you learn how to do it when you're 18, it doesn't, it's like, okay, you've like checked that box. When you learn how to do your laundry when you're five, it is this enormous accomplishment. It like builds your confidence. It, it helps you build your character. And so um, just engaging with real life at, at, at a, starting from a young age, um, basically starting from when you're one, you know, um, it's really important and, and, it, and it provides benefits that learning it later doesn't. And, and it's kind of true from uh, when we approach it from the other direction as well, children, the older they are, the more they feel if a task is useless and they lose respect um, of the people forcing them to do useless stuff and they are going to be sabotaging that work. They are going to be living in a double reality, right? Where there is the kind of power demanding some silly thing of you that doesn't make any sense just so they occupy you, right? And versus, you know, grandpa asking you to help with the logs and you're like, yay, because then that thing is done and it's useful and you know exactly, I mean, we have all the evolutionary incentives to kind of just instinctively know when we are being useful. And one of our deepest worry in life, right? I mean, if you, I'm pretty sure that if you eavesdropped on anybody in therapy, it would transpire that, you know, one of the big worry of, of people, of adults, is that they are not useful, that they will be discarded or that they are not, you know, they don't feel rewarded for their work. Um, and I think also like, you know, setting that bar in to the right place for children so they know how to seek that out and how to get real feedback, how to, you know, choose a vocation that makes them happy, that makes them feel fulfilled in a job that actually contributes to society. I think that would probably have a very long, uh, very good long-term effect. And I know that Matt, you kind of noticed this um, phenomenon um, with your college students and then you were like, where should, where should we start? And you went back to um, Montessori school, um, deciding that you should actually like, you know, just start building up generations who by the time they are 18, they know how to, um, how to do their laundry. They know how to do their laundry and they also know, they know how to love effort. I mean, that is, I mean, that is the thing. I mean, it's not like, this is Montes one of Montessori's, like when she was teaching in the like early 20th century, she had like rich aristocratic parents come and bring them their kids. And then the, these parents complained. They're like, why are you having my child sweep the floor? Like they have servants. They're never going to have to lift a broom in their life. And, and, and she's like, it's not about sweeping the floor. Like it's about, it's about learning to understand your efficacy in the world and to appreciate the kind of value of effort. And I mean, I do think that people should know how to do their own laundry, but um, like really the issue is that with 18 year olds is that, you know, they, they hit an obstacle and they give up. And that's related to not knowing how to do your laundry. And it goes, another benefit is that it really enhances um, family connection because you're going to like hanging out with your children. If you know that you're at work and you're going to bring home a colleague or something and you call them and I need you to clean up and prep something and do something for me and you know you can rely on your children to do that, really really connect the family, really glues together the family. I know I can go on a road trip with them with like, we're going to be able to pack all of us in two hours and they're going to be real help. And I know they're going to be able to cook and they're going to be able to help out with everything. So I really enjoy being with them and not sure that many parents do really enjoy being with their children. And that's a big one too. So yeah, I think you should raise your children so that you really like them and like hanging out with them. And work is a big part of that because you want to sh be sharing not just the um, fruits, <laughs> but also the work.
maybe one of the great takeaways of this whole pandemic is that you can't just outsource and buy education. It's not like you go to the supermarket and you're like, well, this school has good Yelp reviews. Um, so there you go, spend eight years there or 16 year, years there. It's something where you can't, you know, you have to get involved. But I, th I do think that parents do want to get involved. It's just like, you don't know how much you're supposed to or where do you start or are you overstepping some line, right? I'm, and, and, and I think parents seem, generally, at least in my generation, seem relatively confused about like how involved should they get in their children's lives, right? Because we all have our own kind of PTSD from our own parents and you don't know, should I, am I too much? Am I too little? Is it going to be like an 80s kid who is like raised by TV and chips? Or am I going to be a, you know, 90s parent, 90s kid who's like kind of hovering over the child and shielding, from the, shielding them from the wind? And I, I kind of feel like it's not just education that parenting and relationship with children should be Re rediscovered and re, you know, um, rebuilt. Um, just the fact that you know um, that most adults who don't have children never meet children, which is also kind of insane that you have these cities full of, you know, thirty-year-old single people who don't regularly meet children. They don't. Also, they don't regularly meet older people, right? You meet maybe if, if your boss or your professor is older or like service workers, but you don't really have a conversation. If you live in London and if you're like 31, you're not going to have a longer conversation with an older person as a friend. And you're also not going to have a friendly chat with the child, right? And I think that also kind of builds into some of these, you know, confusions of like the first child you will ever speak to is your own child. That seems like a pretty risky thing, right? With a lot to lot to um, lose. Then of course, when the child is three, you're like, now finally somebody who knows what they're doing can take over. Um, but I would actually like to kind of like end this conversation with, with solutions. And my first question to you about this would be, you know, of, of course, every parent is heavily influenced, not just by the current culture and media in which they are, you know, they live their, lead their lives, but also from, you know, how they grew up and what, you know, country or culture or socioeconomic background they spend their childhoods in. How is it in, important for a parent when they are designing the education of their children to kind of distance themselves from the kind of their priors um, about education? Um, or is it something to actually like be proud of passing, passing on? I'm asking this because most parents are in such a unique situation now. Um, that I mean, they, I think, yeah, story. I mean, not as like, I don't think it's like a fundamental, I don't think it's like a principle that you have to kind of distance yourself from the priors. I think the principle is that um, you have to think about it. <laughs> and, um, and that means typically at some point reflect like being like hey like this is pro how i was educated and raised is one way among many like i should think about other other ways and other cultures and other approaches in history and other philosophies and other ideas and what went right and what went wrong and that i think that process in some sense involves distance from your priors and in another sense it's like really engaging with them and taking them seriously um i mean i think like if you if you kind of in, in some ways like if you think about I don't know how it works, um, how it works where you guys are, but in the US, like the banking system is pretty heavily regulated and insured. And like, it, it's kind of set up so that you don't have to worry about like the average person going to deposit their money into a savings account never has to think about like, is this bank going to fail? Or like the grocery store, like there's, there's the Food and Drug Administration in the US, like you're not gonna have to worry about getting like toxic rotten meat or something, like that's all regulated. Um, like edu education, like is basically like that it's like set up i think by society specifically so that parents don't have to think about it like i think we've tried to structure it to kind of take away that thought and that choice except there is no fdic and there is no fda and we don't know anything about education and like you have to think about it and so i think that, that like i do think that that is the fundamental here in some ways is like embrace the work as a parent like like there's no bypassing the fact that there aren't easy answers here and um, and you've got to get to know your child and you've got to kind of figure out what the options are and you've, and you've got to you know reflect on how to best support them in learning and growing and and the like if there is a default that you're on that you haven't thought that much about it is probably defective in some way um, and um, yeah I mean that it's a it's a process it's a lot of work I mean it's like imagine like you had to 
put your money in a bank worrying about whether or not the bank would fail. What kind yeah, of, what I was kind just of going to ask, like, how, would a, how would an FDA for education um, look? I mean, we have the U.S. Department of it. We have these things in the U.S. I just don't think that we, like, I don't, my view is that we don't know that much about education as a society. This is Violetta was saying, do we, and Montessori and these thinkers were writing a hundred years ago, we still have basically the Prussian model of education um, worldwide. Like, uh, you know, I, I, just, I don't want there to be a panel of experts that kind of takes the choice away. In fact, I think that that's, that's part of the problem. We need to kind but of also engage we don't know what, in the, in the what we measure, right? Like we don't know what yeah. we measure, so it doesn't get improved. Like what the FDA measures is, are you going to get sick? Are there like things in the, that food that are going to kill you or give you cancer? We don't know what's the equivalent in terms of education, right? We know what it is. It's human potential. We just don't know uh, how to measure it. Yeah, I'm going to pick up on Matt's view that, and I agree very much with it, that it's very hard work. Uh, but I think the parents should wake up because if they have the skin in the game, nobody else cares that much, as much as you. So if anything, I'm not so worried about their priors because they were, most of them, like parents my age, were free range children and they were free right and now we don't give this to our own children so um not so much focusing on their priors but maybe on their current assumptions and the assumption that you have to push your child to have good grades and you have to put them through the factory and if you see that your child is anxious and is not happy and she's not thriving, then I think it's on you as a parent to do that work. Um, and yeah, it's hard, but I think, I think it's, you have to take things into your own hands, really. What should be one thing that after watching this video, um, every parent should go and, and, and do? Um, a change, uh, a to-do list of uh, the fridge or back on the fridge, a frank conversation with their children about schooling, or maybe some books or literature that they should, you know, delve into. Um, what would be your advice? Um, obviously, you're kind of approaching from two different, um, you know, uh, uh, angles here. So I would, I would just love to put together a little, uh, maybe, um, um, you know, list of solutions and, and possibilities for, for parents. Yeah, my, every time I'm asked about this, I, I think my secret to my success with my children is that um, I just pay attention to them. So if there's one immense thing that you could do is just look at them, pay attention. What are they doing? See every shadow on their face. See their sad day, um, their happiness, their gossip from school, their their anxiety like instead of asking how was your day when they come home for example i ask them to oh, tell me something juicy from school today and just go with go with just paying attention and being natural like curious i am naturally curious i'm really curious about children and i was going to ask you anna since you're coming from generations of educators probably that's a trait you have too right like where you're really really curious about like children just as much as you would about meeting a new adult, a new person. Yeah, but it also gives me this sense that um, that adults are children too. Like, I don't really see a big distinction. I feel a lot of responsibility toward children because I'm bigger and stronger and have a bank account and can vote and have a lot of, you know, um, a lot of ways I can contribute to society and to those who don't have these things. Um, but when it comes to like, I really, really dislike when dislike to see when a child is talking and the adult just hears this buzz. Yeah. Like it didn't matter. And it's like that, first of all, the child is trying to communicate with you. Like they wouldn't say these same words to another person. So you're just kind of sabotaging the, the conversation, the channel, you're, you're blocking the channel. Um, and on the other hand, it's like super interesting. I mean, where else would you hear super interesting things if not from a child? Like they see the world as if literally for the first time and they can tell you about it. And it's awesome. And just, I think we, I mean, I've never really, I, I, I don't see children being like super overestimated because the parents want their kids to be geniuses 
and uh, any kind of like you know weakness the child may or, or, or sad day that the child may go through um, the parents parent feels like this is their failure or their feedback and, and it's kind of like builds into their personal struggles and on the other hand I see children regularly being really underestimated I don't think that children will be kind of like put in front of these crappy cartoons all day um, if parents knew that actually a child will be super interested in a in a in a, in a you know Attenborough movie and you can actually give them you know really difficult information and they they have the, the the fresher brains why do we like I am in many ways dumber than the child right like kind of an, as an adult so so that would be kind of like my um, maybe genetic response to <laughs> pedagogical questions. <laughs> Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, just in terms of like concrete advice, definitely the number one advice I would give is the same as Violet: is observe your children, pay attention to your children. Like that is, um, and that, and if you, if that's not natural to you, like if it's not like with what, what Anna was just describing, Anna, sorry, now I'm paranoid about pronouncing your name. Um, um, is is. Um, it doesn't come naturally to everybody. Like it's not, it's like, it's like valuing anything as a kind of skill. There's no how it's like, what exactly are you paying attention to in your child? So if it doesn't come natural to you, just be patient with yourself and cultivate it, I would say. Um, um, which, and so this, so I guess the, the one big piece of advice I'd add to Violet is, is um, you, I think both she and I have emphasized, like it's, it's hard work. You got to get in there. You've got to embrace it. Like, you should enjoy your time with your kids. Like I, I, none of what I've been saying, I don't think what she's been saying is designed to make you feel like guilty or pressured. It, it's um, um, if you are observing your children and you love your children and you're kind of actively taking the time to kind of enjoy that, like you are doing a lot already for your children. Um, and then the third piece of advice I would give, which is a distant third. So I always get yelled at for being an ideologue, but um, you know, read about Montessori, read about like read about some of these alternative education methods. Like that, that again, that it, it's going to help your like just these little ideas here and there will help your parenting. It's so interesting to me that when you know couples are expecting a baby, you know, they will read all sorts of different books about, for example, pregnancy and the baby, and they will read a lot of competing information, like competing, um, you know, frameworks of information, right? It's very normal for like an intellectual or a couple to, you know, sit down and read, you know, child psychologists, et cetera, et cetera, who did not agree with each other. And they will sit down and discuss it and be like, well, it looks like whether we put the child on its belly or on its back, we are terrible parents. So we might as well kind of like make up our own system because the literature is competitive and not aligned. But we don't really do this with schools. Like even in our household, like my mom would have all these books about like pregnancy and childbirth and how to breastfeed and blah, blah, blah. And all the kind of the big names were there, right? But they were very antithetical to each other. But we didn't have the same thing about, I don't even know if there is, popular literature about elementary schools. In some there ways, isn't almost great stuff. I mean, yeah. I mean, there, the, I mean, one of the thing, a kind of distinction in your mind that if you can obliterate it is a superpower is the distinction between early childhood education and K-12 education. Like, the, like there's this huge distinction in the modern world between those two things where it's like, one is like daycare or developmental or like, primarily like medical or whatever, or it's, or it's the mother. And the other one is like schools and desks. And, and like, it's just one process of growing up and it's all education and it's all development. And, um, and you know, it, it is, it's a total artifact of the K-12 education system that people think of it like that. And it's really destructive to mothers and parenting and all sorts of things. So um, yeah, soapbox ended. I think children are faring better that you left the college students to their own devices, literally. Um, <laughs> went back to work uh, with, with younger kids. Um, thank you so much, guys. Next round, I'm going to interview your kids because I know that kids of educators have their own opinion about this whole thing. Um, surely my parents did. Um, thank you so much, guys. Is there anything else you may want to add to uh, maybe if a, if a child watches us, what should they do with their parents? <laughs> kind of the coda of the conversation and, and then we will wrap up first of all yeah. child use rome <laughs> right
and make your parents pay attention to you. Demand attention, the right kind. Yeah, I mean, if you're a child, like ch some children actually, I don't know where they get this, but they get the skill of kind of managing up. Do you guys know that term where you're like, um, kind of like exerting influence on your supervisors or boss or whatever? Like some children are good. Like I would say as a child, like judge, like judge whether or not the education that you're getting is good or bad. Judge whether or not what your parents are doing to you is fair um, or good. Um, and then even if, it, even if it's bad, you'll at least know that it's bad and you won't just be absorbing it. And if it's good, great. Like you'll kind of think about it. Like um, I think being active minded as a child is, will protect you from almost any influence because you'll be processing it. Thank you so much. So kids, if you watch us um, tonight, um, here's some takeaway, um, how, how to manage the managers as well. Thank you so much guys. And I can't wait to read your books about this. I think you both have uh, multiple volumes in you uh, that I'm sure people would love to read um, and see you at, see you at the salons. Yeah, bye, bye everybody who watched, <laughs> take care.